Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our 11th Annual Real Estate Forum. My name is Mark Claude, and I'm the CEO of Commonwealth Commercial. I would ask that everybody kind of find a seat. We have plenty of them up front. Um, buckle in. I think it's going to be a great forum this year. Really do appreciate everybody in attendance. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun, hopefully a lot of uh, information shared. Uh, don't worry about the networking. There'll be plenty of opportunities after this event for that. You know, 11 years ago when we started this forum, uh, we decided not to uh, look in the rearview mirror. We really wanted to focus on the future, uh, talk about things that are impactful to our industry, uh, challenge the attendees, kind of provoke their thoughts. Think about things like real estate cycles, um, what's coming down the road, and I think today will not disappoint. So I'm really, again, very, very excited about that. Um, obviously, a real treat to be able to meet face to face after essentially a two year hiatus. And um, I think it's um, obviously needed and well received. So again, thank you again for all being here. So before I turn this podium over, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the people that um, were involved in the planning of this, of this event and, and the organization of it. So just to recognize the committee uh, David Williams, Scott Keaton, uh, Jamie Thomas, and Leah Ziegler were all instrumental. And Leah Ziegler, uh, once again, took this event on her shoulders and took care of all the details. Where's Leah? Um, so thank you all for the uh, folks on the committee, but also thank you, thank you to, um, to Leah. Really, really super appreciative. At the end of... Um, Chris's talk, we will have uh, three panelists come up and um, maybe express their views of what they heard and how that impacts uh, their industry. These are three what I consider to be uh, well-respected uh, industry experts. So I'm really excited to kind of hear their comments. And of course, we'll have a Q&A session as well for those who want to um, ask questions from the audience. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, please take your cell phones, uh, put them on silent. Uh, out of respect for the fellow attendees. If anybody needs to use the restrooms, I think everybody knows they're out that way. And to the right, plenty of refreshments around here and outside, so help yourself and um, come away from here um, being smarter than when you walked in. So um, thank you again for attending. I'm gonna now ask Rob Rosebro of Marsh to come up and uh, introduce our best in class sponsors. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 11th Annual Commonwealth, excuse me, Com Commercial Real Estate Forum presented by Commonwealth Commercial Partners. I'm Rob Rosebro, Business Development Manager of the Richmond Division of Marsh McLennan Agency. We're very proud to be a longtime sponsor of this event and greatly appreciate your being here this afternoon. I'd like to introduce our sponsors who helped make this event possible. Kiter. Williams Mullen, Arco Design Build Industrial, Marsh McLennan Agency, Lingerfelt Commonwealth Partners, Old Republic Title, Wells Fargo, Atlantic Union Bank, and 10X LoopNet. You can learn more about our sponsors from the materials left in your seat. Now I'd like to turn things over to John Mercer with Williams Mullen to introduce today's speaker. John. Well, wow, spotlights. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the conference. This is like really freaky. We're all getting together again. Isn't this awesome? Yeah, it seems like we're, uh, we're coming out of COVID hibernation. So thank you all for being here. Um, it, this event's been on pause for a couple of years. So Mark, thanks for bringing it back again. And uh, we're really happy to be here. Um, for those of you who don't know, know me, my name is John Mercer. I'm a partner with the law firm of uh, Williams Mullen. Uh, you're probably familiar with the, either dealing with me or a lot of my partners. It's funny, I look around the room and I see, well, I've got a number of clients in here or people that I work with 
over the years, and then everybody under 35 probably drank beer with my children. <laughs> so um, I think I got, I got all the bases covered here. But in any event, um, you know, we've been in this business for 32 years. I've been in this business for 32 years and have sort of seen the roller coaster ride. So I look forward to hear what Chris has to say about the, uh, the next decade. Um, but as a sponsor, we do get that privilege of, 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 uh, of introducing a, our speaker. Um, Chris brings 40 years of experience, both to his clients and his audiences uh, throughout the country. Um, he's got a, a, a team that, that supports him on, on the research, and he really provides a, a really a boatload of services. I mean, he's providing strategic planning, he's providing compensation modeling, uh, he's providing thought leadership, as well as forecasting, and I think the list that go, goes on and on. Um, but he, he, I'd suffice it to say, Chris's opinions and his insights are, are well respected uh, in the industry. Um, his team. I think on, your, on the website has boasted that they've represented over 500 real estate firms uh, in the country. Now, it doesn't seem impressive when you see the 500, but he's listed a lot of them on the website. So if you go onto the firm's website, it really reads like a who's who uh, in the real estate business in the United States. So it, it, it's very impressive. Um, he's also authored several best-selling uh, books on, on leadership. And so um, the one thing that I love the best is that there's a newsletter that uh, Chris and his group put out every month. It's called Strategic Advantage. And um, I like it because it's just, it's a very informative and easy to read um, uh, newsletter. And I encourage you when we're done to look at his website, which is celassociates.com. Um, and th there was in fact a recent posting that Chris did, which I think is a good segue into the program today where he sort of did a look back of the last four decades of commercial real estate in the United States. And it sort of was like playing uh, when you go back and get your old vinyl cover and you're playing your, your, your best hits album because you go back and you read about what happened in the industry in the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s and so forth. And it's, it's very informative um, and very thoughtfully done. But there was a paragraph right at the beginning of your recent, uh, recent newsletter that I really think strikes home to where we are right now and also where I think Chris is gonna lead uh, during his, his presentation. And uh, just indulge me, I'm gonna read some of it because I think it's very well written. It says, the real estate industry has weathered, successfully navigated and nearly made it to the finish line, or should we say the new start line as a result of the 2020s COVID-19 crisis. While some in the real estate industry were and continue to be more challenged than others. The years ahead will be an exciting new journey. However, there is no return to the way it used to be and no return to the old normal. The truth is the past was not better than today. It's just different. We can't go back to the comfort of certainty, but we can look forward with excitement to an era of uncertainty. That's an understatement. Opportunities, surprises, and incredible innovations. The real estate industry post COVID must shed the baggage of yesterday and embrace the, embrace the exciting but uncertain future rapidly coming into focus before our eyes. Against that backdrop, I can't wait to learn more. So please join me in welcoming Chris Lee. Thank you. God, the way John was rolling, he must have given my whole presentation. <laughs> thank you, thank you, John. Thank you, Commonwealth, and all the sponsors for inviting me here today. It's a, it's exciting to be here. Um, last time I was here, I think it was in 2015 and 2016, and so much has changed during that time. So many things have have up sort of upset or, or or modified how we do business in real estate. That I think today you're going to find quite transforming. Try, you know, try sort of an insight into what kind of trends are going to happen, likely to happen in the future, and how you best can respond to that. Because tomorrow is really upon us today. COVID took, you know, COVID, which was supposed to be over with, right? But it moved our real estate industry. What was going to happen in 2030 really got happen in 2020, 2021, and 2022. So we've accelerated all this rapid change during that period of time. 
And that's why I think today's presentation is gonna be exciting. So there is no more typical, everything's gonna be unique. What you used to trust, you can't really trust anymore. Um, and as Yogi Berra said, it ain't, it ain't over until it's over. So as we look at where we're going tomorrow and where we are today here, I'm excited again to be here. I look forward to any of your questions that you have afterwards. As a matter of housekeeping, um, if any of you want a copy of my presentation afterwards, just give me your business card, I'll be glad to email it to you. And by giving you a business card, you will be on, on the mailing list to, uh, to get our newsletters, which come on regularly. There's no charge for that, so hope you enjoy it. Okay, so let's get started. There's a lot of, I have 195 slides to get through in 30 minutes, so we're gonna go pretty quickly here. Um, so what are we gonna, what's the agenda for today? What I wanna start with here is really some future headlines that you're likely to see. Then I'll talk about the economic shifts, the recovery outcomes, and some of the challenges that are facing our industry is today. I will talk about real estate cycles because we are in a cyclical business and this business does respond to those cycles. I'll talk about the 30 different transformational changes occurring simultaneously today. I actually wanna talk about all 30, I'll just show one slide shows them all, but it really will highlight again this tumultuous period that we're in. I'll give you the outlook for each of the, the major four asset classes. I'll tell you why I like Virginia. Um, and then I'll end with some predictions where I think it's gonna happen by 2030. And so that'll give you an insight of, I think, this massive change. So I'm gonna get started, I'm gonna go pretty quickly. Um, but again, save your questions afterwards when there's a panelist. And again, I'll be glad to answer those. So what are the kind of headlines you're likely to see? Do not be surprised to see a headline like this in the Richmond Times Dispatch, where it says Patagonia to open its first totally sensory apartment. Experience the outdoors in your unit. People today are working on bringing the outdoors in your life into the places that you live. That experiential, that sensory way of looking at things. So this changes the nature of things like apartment units or apartment building. Okay, that. Don't be surprised to see a headline like this, where banks, GSEs, and life companies announce plans to cut lending to non-environmentally compliant real estate projects. This is already being discussed today. This is already being processed a lot by ESG initiatives. And you will see this kind of thing happening where your asset, if you sell it, must have a degree of money as escrow in order for you to be compliant going forward. Do not be surprised to hear about that. Don't be surprised to see this headline in the Washington Post where the Mayo Clinic announces medical smart walls for lifestyle living, sensors that can monitor your critical health factors to enrich lives. This technology already exists today. This technology is beginning to become deployed in places where people live. And so it no longer makes your, your apartment unit or your house, it's not just a, a unit or a house, it's where you might get medical advice and guidance. You might plug in and get, you know, sort of diagnostics coming from where you live. It changes the nature of what real estate is. It's not just four walls. What goes, it's what goes on inside those four walls that matters the most. Don't be surprised to hear like this. Marriott acquires Avalon Bay to launch national lifestyle platform. Avalon Bay, one of the premier multifamily REITs in the country here. What would happen if Marriott acquired them? And every month you stayed at a Avalon Bay apartment, you got Marriott reward points that you could use in a Marriott hotel or Marriott travel experiences. Think of the value that you can get. And what is an apartment except a longer hotel stay? It's the same. And so you begin to see where there's an intersection happening here, or places, this, is, this place is a Marriott, you know, or an intersection between some of these great service providers and what we traditionally have looked at in terms of real estate. So don't be surprised that's a headline like that. Or how about this headline? First office building constructed that consumes smog and generates its own power. This already exists today. Already exists today. You can take a look all over the web. You can see all kinds of examples of the of buildings that are live and vibrant and growing, the green walls, the generation of different things. This means that so many buildings we have today are going to become antiquated. Buildings are going to have to be retrofitted and, and improved in terms of being more environmentally compliant, but also to address the things like that. So don't be surprised to see a headline like this happening. How about this one? The federal, the feds, right? The boys down the street here, 
they mandate a health rating for all commercial buildings. Post COVID, that's what you're seeing today. So they're looking at how are we assuring the health and well being of every single tenant in every single building. There is a health rating system today that exists nationally and globally that buildings can go qualify for, which truly serves their needs, but it shows how healthy your building is. Do not be surprised to see every single building have a health rating by these national and international firms and going forward. You can see that these kind of changes are transformative. They're making real estate far different than it was ever before. How about this one? Anybody, any, if anyone's here from CBRE, God bless you, you're gone. Um, <laughs> no, just, but just don't be surprised to see that where Google acquires CBRE. Why would they do that? Because they want to control the data. And CBRE has more data than anybody else. I mean, they control that. So just think about the opportunity that that happens if now CBRE or transactional folks from CBRE, the knowledge part is controlled by Google. Don't be surprised. So what does this all mean? Well, meanwhile, all these headlines are occurring. We have economic shifts going on and all these recovery outcomes post COVID. Let's take a look at some of those. First of all, you take a look at this slide here. We just finished every, you know, this is the economic drivers. We just you know, went through 2021, which is we kind of figured it out a con. We came out of the COVID. We'll be, let's just figure it out. What are we going to do here? Right into this year, 2022, this is transformational. Things are being set, strategies are being deployed, capital is developing its own strategies of how they're going to grow into the future here. This is transformational. Right now, you are on the cusp of this transformational period, and this is the greatest opportunity for you to change what you're doing to be able to be successful for the next several years to come. And then we'll get into 2023, and that's going to be sort of the beginning of this generational and demographic change. All these, how many are boomers? So just raise your hand if you're boomers. Just raise your hand. Okay, come on, look around. These people are all toast. They're gone. Um, you know, so they're drooling out of their mouth and wheeling, you know, whatever they're doing. You know? And so the point of this is, is we're going to change because they wanted to retire before COVID and COVID made them stick around longer. Okay, but as things happen, we're going to go through these changes. These changes drive the economic engine for real estate and our economy. Everyone in this country, everyone in this room has seen every aspect of their lives change because of COVID, everything. The way you work, the way you shop, the way you learn, the way every single thing on that chart is changed and is not going back. And so because of that change, we as an industry have to always look at those future, look at those things that are happening and say, how, are, how is our organization responding? How are our buildings responding? How are our customers responding? How are we addressing these things? But every aspect of our lives have changed. Sometimes good, sometimes bad, but they've changed. And we have to make sure we acknowledge that. The impact of the consumer right now, based on this Russian Ukraine thing going on, right? It's a horrible thing. But take a look, if you look at the red marks, that's the bad part there. Whether that's you know, the, the negative impacts from gasoline to food prices, we're seeing it ripple down. What does that do to the economy? What does that do to the way in which consumers behave? How much do they buy or don't buy? We're already seeing the supply chain shortages not caused by Ukraine, but just you know, in general, uh, that have happened here across the board. So consumers are beginning to change as well. This is why we're in this period of massive change it's occurring and you're right at the beginning of it. The other thing that your, your friends up, up, up the street here tend to do, they like to spend a lot of money. Um, and so what we're doing here, this amount of debt, the amount of debt that the federal government is incurring from negative budgets and added stimulus packages and all those kinds of those trillions and trillions of dollars, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. And if you try to pay for it, it takes money out of the consumer, higher taxes, more borrowing, and also potentially creates that inflationary environment. So we got to begin to manage with what we have. And so you take a look at this looming debt crisis. This is debt. These are actual debt numbers, right? All of these debts are obligations that are there. I don't care whether it's credit card loans, home equity loans, you know, Medicare liabilities, almost $34 trillion. These are in, tr in trillions of dollars, okay? The unfunded liabilities are about $169 trillion. Our GDP is only $24 trillion. Look at that third box down there. In, 1950, in 1960, 
it was a, the ratio between US debt to GDP ratio, so the debt to GDP, 53% in 1960, 35% in 1980, only 58% in 2000. Today, 139% and rising. That is not sustainable. And so therefore the changes that have to occur to bring that in because our public debt could reach $50 trillion by 2030. That will put a tremendous crimp on a lot of consumer level activity. How do we do out of COVID? We're doing pretty well coming out of the most, most who's, in, who's in office right now? Raise your hand if you're in office. Okay, you're toast too, so forget you guys. Um, other than office and retail a little bit, but you take a look here that you know, office has had some struggles, obviously, because why? Work from home, how much space do I need? Who's gonna come in? Who's not gonna come in? How is this going on here? So all that begins to change. Uh, industrial, absolute home run. E-commerce, absolute home run has come in there. And I don't see that at, at all you know, subsiding. That's gonna continue like a hockey stick you know, forward. Hospitality, clearly, I mean, retail clearly has some challenges. We're all aware of that. We have too much retail space now in our country. That's going through transformation as well redefining what that omni-channel is for retailers and what omni-channel will work in most retail settings. You take a look at residential, a lot of green. We came out of this pretty well. Multifamily has been the, the biggest you know, uh, winner of all of this here, and you'll see that in just a few slides. But that all just shows that kind of change. But what hasn't changed? Well, sometimes the senior housing, the active adult, and, the, and obviously the um, age restricted, anything that deals with when the COVID got put in nursing homes or elderly places and it wasn't done well, and they don't have the management companies yet to fulfill some of those responsibilities. So that's come out of there a little bit slower. But what are these top 10 challenges everyone in this room is facing, our industry is facing today? The economic challenge, the challenges of inflation, obviously eight and a half percent, you just saw the number come up there in the last week or two. Interest rate increases, very likely to happen. Some have said 11, some have said three big ones, who knows what the number is, but it's going to happen. We're gonna have absolute rate increases. Slowing GDP, it's slowing down pretty dramatically. These global conflicts may perhaps even stagflation, where wages don't keep pace as well with, with the, the rise of consumer goods. We also have talent challenges. Probably the biggest challenge of all that most firms have is, is finding and retaining and motivating great people. So the, the whole work from home, the great resignations that have happened because of that, uh, we clearly have uh, you know, the re recruitment uh, challenges, the retention challenges, the rising compensation expectations, all that's happened, which comes down to that workplace challenge because that work from home, the, those resignations, those COVID protocols, all those things begin to happen. We believe in our industry about only 35% of the workforce will come back on a full-time basis, only 35%. 65% will come back and whether that's four days a week, three days a week, two days, but not full time. So that'll change and come forward here. We have investment challenges. We have too much capital. It's about $260 billion of already raised capital that has trying to find a home right now. There's way too much capital in a world in a, in a world in crisis right now. Where does capital go? They go to hard assets. They go to real estate. So capital comes in your flight capital, other investment capital. We have a lot of money. We're just keeping cap rates down but there's fewer deals. How do I make the yields? How do I make this work? How is this going to happen here? And then we have obviously rising debt costs with interest rates going up. So this changes some of that transaction. We also have technology challenges, automation, AI, predictive analytics, you know, digitization, modularization. It changes everything we're doing. It changes everything we're doing. The same thing, we also have regulatory challenges. We have the protracted entitlement process. It takes so freaking long to get things done anymore. Weeks and go into months and months go into years and just takes so long. Environmental regulations, environmental oversight, some of which is needed, some of which may not be needed. But the point of it is, it takes protracted, the regulatory challenges make it very expensive to do development deals in particular. We have rising operating challenge, uh, uh, challenges. We have rising costs to conduct business, whether it's rising legal costs, rising rent costs, rising insurance, utilities, labor, materials, all those are rising as well. How do I manage that? How do I manage through them? We have the public-private indebtedness challenge as well. National, state, local, all those pension funds, those obligations to public employees and all that that's gone forward. How does that get paid? Where's it coming from? And how is it gonna be done except with a lower level of services or costs or rising taxes? 
We have ESG and DEI challenges as well. And I'll show you some slides about that. We're not doing as great a job, we're starting, but we do a heck of a lot better. But we're accelerating that implementation, accelerating that actualization. And then we, of course, we have the market shifts, changing demographics, you know, migration, the generational conflicts, generational shifts that are happening and going on here. All of these make for every one of you, you gotta be on your game. You gotta be on your game in order to win tomorrow. So where are we in this cycle? What's happening? How does this work? Real estate has three different cycles. They got a mega cycle, which happens every four years. We have a uh, super cycle, which happens every 20 years. We have our decades cycle, which happens every 10 years. So you can take a look at that. We're in the digital age. We're not through with that yet up on the 40 year. We're in the generational and demographic transition. That's the aging of the boomers and the millennials and others coming in, the Gen Zs moving forward as well as the migration patterns that have happened as well. And then we have a one that we're in right now, this decade that goes from 2020 to 2029. Age of legacy exits. You are seeing probably 30 to 35% of real estate firms are not gonna be in existence today, will not be in existence by the end of this decade. Those many real estate firms were founded back in the 70s and the 80s. So a lot of those folks are now 60, 70, or 80 years of age, and they're transitioning. Either they sell their business, they hopefully transition maybe to a younger group, or they just go out of business. But those legacy exits change what's going on. Technology disruptors, obviously innovation, which happens on a regular basis here, and social change. All this is a cycle that we are in today. And in real estate, every single real estate cycle has started on a year that ends in a two, three, or four, the last 60 years. And every cycle has ended on a seven, on a year that ends in a seven, eight, or a nine, in the last 60 years. So what happened? You take right there, where did we peak? We peaked at, well, oh, I'm sorry, a nine, 2019, happened there. I didn't know COVID was gonna happen. We knew though that we were getting to a point of peaking, that that was gonna occur when we talked about this back in 2015 here. As that begins to happen, I was warning and saying that 2019 is going to be a peak, and we're on the way down. You can see we are second quarter down there toward the bottom. Um, we're about ready to change. And that's why all this change, this, this, the debt structure, the taxes, the global conflicts, all these things begin to happen. The only thing that can screw up a real estate cycle is the government, because they can postpone the inevitable. Well, we'll just have a three or four or five trillion dollars, and that kind of pushes it off another six months or a year. But it will happen, and it will occur. And that's where we are today. So we're just getting ready. Where is most money made in real estate cycles that's made at the bottom and made on going on the way up? So you're right there. You're at a great place. If you're able to pivot, able to change, able to make the kind of shifts you have to do to, to become competitive, you'll absolutely win. So what happens? Those of you that, that took um, uh, psychology in college, there was a, a psychologist named Abraham Maslow. And Maslow had a thing called the hierarchy of needs. And he said, you never could be actualized until you finished all the stuff at the bottom. Simple way of looking at it. But the same thing happens in both economy. And you can take a look at the hierarchy of needs from a recessionary economy all the way up to a robust economy. It also then shifts to a real estate side because in a recessionary economy, what happens? Basic necessity real estate always performs. And, it, and we get to only at the robust economy do this, does the discretionary real estate perform. Now, what does it mean on the right-hand side? Look what's happening. When you are where we are today, we're not in a clearly a robust economy and everything. So some of the entertainment, some of the second homes, you know, lifestyle, some of these things are challenged because people don't have the money as they might have in a, you know, what they would have had it, obviously in a robust economy. But what always, always, always does well is in the right-hand corner. And if I had to tell you three words, three words that will always make you money in real estate and real estate cycles, food, shelter, and wellness. People want to eat, right? You have to eat, right? So I like grocery. I like things that are food because people have to eat. Shelter, people have to have a roof over their head. Minimal size is, is what? Uh, an apartment building or KOA campground or whatever. But you got, at some point there, housing is extremely important. And wellness. 
if I break a leg, get sick, whatever, I want to go and get it fixed, whether it's at a hospital or an outpatient facility or MOB or wherever it might be, but I'm going to do that. Food, shelter, and wellness always wins, no matter what cycle you're in. It's the other stuff that gets a little screwy. This chart here kind of just try to highlight what that means, food, shelter, wellness, and the other part I just call transition. But if you just look at that number, those, those things up there, everything up in there is going to be a winner, a winner in the next 10 years. And so you look at that from food, shelter, wellness, you look at transition and even you have self storage or data storage at the bottom and transition or whatever that is, all of those things are winners. But it only means that we have to think differently. We cannot do the same things over and over again. And so these asset classes are going to perform. These are going to do quite well over the next 20 years or so. What I like about LEED, what I like about environmental stuff is here is that Virginia is number five, number five on a per capita list here. And I, and I love that because it has more project is going in that direction. We have to be more environmentally sensitive. We have to be more attuned to that. And so I love Virginia for, because of that. It's moving in that direction. But so do you when you manage, when you build, when you develop, when you change your building around, you have to be sensitive to those environmental issues. But take a look at what's happening in mortgage loan origination. This is from the Mortgage Bankers Association. That slide right there tells you it all. Take a look at multifamily and take a look at industrial. The two winners. Take a look at that, that index value has changed so dramatically as compared to office and retail. And so where is the capital gone? E-commerce through e-commerce industrial, warehouse distribution, and multifamily for rent properties, even now single family for rent. But we do have that $250 billion of dry powder I talked about earlier on the sidelines waiting to be deployed, which is going to keep cap rates down. It's not, they're not going to just only dry, jump up two or 300 basis points. Not going to happen. So the capital is there. What might change is the interest rates, obviously, on the debt side. So how has asset performance changed? Take a look here at the one year, the three year, the five year. Most importantly, look at the three, five, and 10 year long there. And you can take a look at what industrial done, obviously what multifamily done, versus what retail has done as an example. Interestingly, over the last 25 years, the greatest performing asset class has been cell storage, by far, the best asset class. Because when you, when you have a lot of money, you're going up here, people want to, where am I going to put all this crap, put it in there. When you don't have any money, you're trying to downsize, put the crap over there, okay? And you know, Parents die, put their crap over here. Everything happens, you know, just put crap in a building. Um, but that just creates a lot of that opportunity around that self-storage and a lot of trans transitory nature. So I talked about what are those 30 things? What are those 30 things that are happening right now simultaneously? Take a look at the slide here. I tried to use the smallest font so no one could read it, but I just try to make sure that you have that. But as you look at it here, all of those across the way, every single one of those, is occurring right now. This is not an old normal. We are not going back the way it was. These things are happening at, at, at light speed. And because of that, we're going to have to be able to change and address these in, in all of your business models, all of the way in which you approach you know, your, your, your long-term strategic thinking. All 30 of these are occurring simultaneously. The staffing models in our, in our industry are changing as well. We're moving much more from that 80% full-time workers, 20% contingent workers to the other way around. Probably 20% full-time workers and 80% contingent workers. Free agents, self-employed, leased employees, all those different categories were change in nature and work from home and COVID accelerated that. This was gonna take several years to occur. This has occurred much quicker than people thought. And it's very hard to find people today, very hard to, you know, to recruit great talent, but you can find great talent who says, yeah, but I want to work from home. I'm going to do this. I can do that. Well, what do you do? Don't hire someone or you hire them and accommodate that to get the work done. That just changes the nature of the staffing models that are occurring because of that technology digitization and the manner in which employees are now working. Post COVID, these are the sectors that are at risk. Because again, COVID accelerated everything that was supposed to happen over the next decade, they pushed it into a couple of years. So when you took a look at what can be automated, 
I cannot tell you how many real estate firms we work with across the country are offshore to the Philippines, offshore to here, offshore to India. They're using automation, the new technologies, things are being deployed in a rapid, rapid way because of that. And so it makes some of these positions obsolete or no longer needed, which then requires a company to say, well, how does it get done? What kind of space do I need? What kind of people should I be hiring? How do I create value today in real estate? Age composition in our industry. Take a look at that. We still have almost 46% of old folks here, okay? How many people are young here? Just raise your hand. Just please, if you're under the age of, yeah, not you, under the age of 30. But the young people here, this is, you're in a cornucopia of opportunity. You should walk in tomorrow and say, I just heard Chris speak and I want a 20% raise. Give it to me tomorrow. <laughs> because that's what you have the ability to do now. I'm sorry. Cut that out. But the point of it is, is that because of the aging group of people, we've got to bring more young people into our industry. We've got to make it attractive. We've got to make it dynamic. We've got to make it look like we're serving a purpose, not just fulfilling the needs of capital. Women, women in the C-suite in real estate. Take a look at that number right there, roughly 9% compared to other industries. And so I view this as an opportunity factor to go out and recruit and to bring in and become more diverse in how we look at things. Because if you're trying to go find, do a deal, you're trying to go to a city hall, you're trying to go to a bank, a lender, a capital investor, and, you, and there's women in the room and you put, you know, four old guys walking in there, you know, you're toast. I mean, it's just not going to happen. You've got to be able to be reflective of the community under which you live and which you operate. And this just highlights that, it highlights that kind of thing. I've given several speeches to crew and, and it, it, I would encourage every woman in this room who is not a member of crew to join crew. It's just a fantastic organization. Um, so what are the top priorities? We surveyed hundreds of CEOs recently. We said, what are your top priorities? And really the top priority is talent, is taking center stage. So reshaping the business model, number one, how, what the heck? do I do? How do I respond? How do I change? How do I make this more dynamic? I want to be around 10 years from now. That is requires what? It requires talent, people, leadership, growing revenues to cover overhead. Very important. Property management, very important. Or asset management or fund management, capital management, anything that has a sort of management name to it. Um, that's a good thing. Finding deals that make sense. Compensation and locking in hypos. Locking in hypos is the most Hypos, high potentials, okay? Not hippos like the big ones, you know, these are hypos. And what that says is if you've got young people, if you've got folks that are working for you and they're talented, you better, better have a good comp program that locks them in. You better go down deeper in the organization in the long-term incentive program. You've got to take care of them because if not, they will go elsewhere for someone who is. That's why these are very important. So these are just the top lists from the CEOs telling us across the country what their priorities are going forward. From a compensation perspective here, 72% of real estate firms were having difficulty finding qualified talent. We finished our survey, I think four or 500 real estate firms, 72% said we cannot find enough good people. That's a shortage. Annual bonuses are going to be clearly up in the 90% range or greater. I wouldn't call them almost performance bonuses, I much I would call them retention bonuses. I want to keep people here, so I'm going to pay them the money, whether they earn it or not, because if I don't, they'll go across the street for someone who will write the check. So retention and one-time exceptional bonuses and all that kind of stuff, that's very common. But there has been a split in our industry between the have and the have-nots, between the haves, multifamily industrial, and the have-nots, retail office, between the C-suite and the value creators, and the process employees and those that can be offloaded from digitization. So we're seeing that change and that shift occurring. We just finished another survey just a, a month or so ago about what, would the, what are the pay raises going to be in 2022? Just take a look at that line right there at the bottom two lines, 75 and 90th, but somewhere around five to 9%, you know, you'll see that or five, six, 7%. And so those are significant raises. Depending on how you look at it here, we have got to be competitive. You can't give a 3% raise. You can't just get by on that with inflation at eight and a half. The other thing we're seeing as well is this population shift. On the left-hand side of the screen, you're seeing what you like is red dots. Red dots mean a whole bunch of folks in housing, okay? On the left side, 1950. 
they're not, hard to see the dots, right? Hard to see Atlanta, hard to see Nashville, hard to see Charlotte, Dallas. Okay. Then using census data for 2030, look at all the red that's come in. Those are bodies that are moved in and moving into those locations that move from Virginia to Florida to Texas is unparalleled, unparalleled in terms of that movement. And you take a look at those, again, those, those statistics, you can see right where you are here, but look at the growth. But Texas is gonna add 10 million or so people, you know, almost 11 million. Virginia is gonna add almost a million two, million three people. That is a lot of movement versus other states was last year, California had a, a negative. People, more people moved out than moved in California. So you're seeing the shifts that happen. Those kind of population shifts benefit you. The market from Virginia to Florida to Texas and all points in between is an absolute dynamic market. And that's why so much capital and so many real estate people and so many investors want to be in that market, which is great for all of you. But as those population shifts occur, you can see here, just in that shift, how many, what percent of population Virginia has gotten versus what percent the other states have gotten versus the US. So you've kind of kept in the sort of the uh, US range, um, but you can take a look at the others. This is without the other immigration that is happening, as you know, the last year or so coming across the border. So which just means we're gonna have a lot of folks in those markets, which obviously need what? Food, shelter, and wellness. All three of those work every time. Household incomes, now they're obviously, they, they cause that, and tax rate cause people to shift. So as you look at median household incomes, clearly going forward from there, and the migration on the right-hand side, people percent moving in versus percent moving out. In Virginia had a few people left, why? Because it's a little expensive sometimes, a little costly to live. But again, where you are here is far better, but take a look at, again, where your income levels are, are much higher. You have a lot more government employees here. You have a lot of people that are, have some significant salaries, which also drives up housing costs, which drives what people can't afford to live, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's sort of connected together. Now we have Zoom towns. And you know what? Richmond made a Zoom town. So you guys are Zoom town. Congratulations, you win. Um, I won't get you much, but anyway, you win. Um, it just means that young people, the Z generation, would like to be in places that are dynamic, that are innovative, that have great universities, have great social activities, they have the kind of things that they want to have their lifestyle around. And Richmond checks a lot of those boxes. That's why it's exciting. That's why I love this place. I just love because it has so many of the attributes that people are looking for. So what is the outlook for each of these sectors? Very quickly, it's very simple office remember that when you went across the top the boomers when they looked at office space and they were you know obviously going there they they first of all they're about ready to retire so they don't want to change their i work my whole freaking career i want my corner office i want my okay they they think they own that but when you plan for the boomers are planning and their space is about 350 square feet per average you go down to gen xers the next folks that are there okay those folks, 250 square feet. You get to millennials, it's 100, less than 150 square feet. And you get down to the Zs, we're down to less than 100 square feet per employee. Now, when you have work from home, digitization, multiple shifts that begin to occur, then that means we have less space. What does that mean for office? We don't need as much space. It will not be absorbed at the pace it was absorbed before because people don't want that. And look at those, those comments there between a collaborative space and working from home and, and, and the personal space, you get down to these Gen Zs, I don't know what's going on. I want it my way, you know, kumbaya, everything's, everybody's got to hug the whale, hug the tree, hug, hug somebody, okay? And all this is, is trying to move forward here. It just means less space. The number of hours that employees work, take a look at this dramatic change between the 1800s and where it is today and the last number we had in 2018 so a couple of years ago but the point of it is is that the number of hours worked in moving up to the top we have reduced the number of hours that people are working and so we're seeing that as a national pattern when you don't have as many people working therefore you have less need for space very simple so work and now follows the worker there isn't a person in this room and have a cell phone, an iPad, a, a laptop, a, a, a watch that talks to you, your freaking whole body's talking to you, okay? And 
All that is because I don't need to be in space. Work comes to me wherever I am. That's different. So space is less important. What's important is the intersection, that intersection of networks and interactive technology where people can gather and get together and exchange knowledge and information. That niche specialists, we think that again, about 50% of the workers are gonna be freelancers or ICs, independent contractors. And as that goes forward, and this has been supported by McKenzie and many others as well, so this is not a wild guess. This is really where we're headed right now, and that happens. So this on-demand workforce, there are websites now you can go, if I need, I need an accountant for an hour, a week, a day, you can get right on the web and get some, boom, like that, working from home, get your work done. You know, these, these sort of on-demand workforces are available. And so decision-making becomes far less centralized. You have life, work-life balances, all those things that happen Yet 58% of office workers want some form of this collaboration. That's why I love this kind of event. One of the first big events that I've been to that people are not wearing masks. And that's exciting. And ULI last week, no one wore a mask at ULI, you know. All these things is, is, is exciting because people need that socialization, particularly the Z generation and the millennials. Because that's how they make their friends and meet their husbands or their wives or whatever. They, it helps in that dynamic. So what's the preference for workers in space then for office space? Well, you can see right here, some form of hybrid. Our study said 35%. If you take a look at here, you only have 37%. So we're very close to what that is. But people want a hybrid of working and we have to accommodate that in our space designs. Corporate centers all across the country are, are op, trying to optimize their current space. And you take a look there and you say, well, they're reconfiguring their space, they're downsizing their space, they're looking at how much space they really need. That's why office is going to take a while to recover in that regard. You take a look at all these people that can work remotely, you know, finance, insurance, management, any of those kind of businesses, you don't need space for that. And so companies are looking at it and COVID, unfortunately for some, help them accelerate automation and digitization. So I don't need an employee anymore because you know what, they weren't coming to work anyway and I'll figure out a way to get it done through automation or AI. But all these industries are changing. 80% of US corporations in this country are accelerating automation and response to COVID, 80%. That means that what they're trying to do is say, I cannot have the same space, I cannot have the same things I've had before. The same thing with this digitization, you can see that right there. Where you take a look at this chart here on the right hand side, 67% of the comp of companies here have shifted in terms of toward automation and use of artificial intelligence. All of that going on. Demand for freelancers. This is another study McKinsey came up with as well. Their feeling was that 70% of executives they surveyed said that they were moving to use of these independent or contractors. We are moving to that society, which means what? It means that cities like Richmond, you don't have to be in Atlanta. You don't have to be in Washington, D.C., or you don't have to be in the major metropolitan areas. You can be other places, Nashville, Lexington, Louisville, you know, wherever. You can go all these places. And that makes it more dynamic. That's why your quality of life in this community is so critical to the success of this community. Having that healthcare and education and entertainment and sports and everything, it's gotta be there. Food, recreation, everything. So what's happened in transactional volume? You can see right there, you know, where it peaked up way back in the 2000s and then it went down and it kind of flopped along there moving forward here. But look at this number right here. And this is from, from uh, you know, co-star data. And looking at that, uh, and they do, they do a wonderful job of, of preparing this kind of stuff. Look at the amount of space that we have constructed since 2010, 2009, very limited. There's over a trillion dollars worth of office space that's considered to be high risk of becoming obsolete. You know, old, may have paint or, um, you know, Wi-Fi issues or other things that may occur right in there. And another trillion dollars or so of space that's considered to be in danger. So we have a lot of older buildings that are going to need to be changed, scraped or retrofitted, an opportunity for someone who knows how to do that well, focusing on that. So what's happened here, you've seen both in the suburban office, you know, obviously people are saying, why should I be in the CBD? Let's move out, move from that place here. So that really makes it much more exciting. 
for the number of transactions, this is every transaction that has occurred in the office space sector here. And if you take a look here, the peak for office was in 2015, the peak. And there's declined since then, or they had a little recovery toward the end of last year, but still since 2015, we're now in 2022. Take a look at Richmond here. You can just kind of look at that, quick, quick look at that. Look at where, again, the rent growth is going to be. It's going to slow and then begin to increase to 3.2% by 24. What did I tell you about the cycles? They begin in a two, three, or four. That's exactly what's happening in your space. That's exactly where you're going to turn. You're on track to be that kind of a cycle and take advantage of it right now when it's in that place. But you only recovered about 50% of the jobs that you're there. You've got still about a million square feet of sublet space to sell in the market here. Your vacancy rate's still higher. We, so you've got some work and recovery to do there. But as that happens, you will see that tenants begin to respond and tenants will begin to come forward, not just based on the space, but based on the lifestyle and the, and the manner in which this community comes together. So what do I expect in office buildings? I think office buildings are gonna shift even more, further to more 18 hour operations. Why am I paying space 24 hours a day and my team is only there from nine to five or eight to five, eight to six? It's dark the rest of the time. I'm gonna bring in another shift. I'm paying doggone rent for that. Why am I not putting people in there? You're gonna see people going in that direction in addition to the ICs. This open floor space plan clearly is gonna change, you know, because that free range work, you know, it's kind of now in COVID kind of highlight a lot of stuff that's concerning around there. So what's happened here, the shift, the desk to seat ratio, the number of things has gone. We don't need as many. That's that come in, get your box, go find your desk, you register and, and go from there. Our daughter works for Nike. She's um, environmental officer up at the Be Beaverton campus. She didn't have an office. You have 17,500 employees. She just uses a calendar to pick whatever she wants. I mean, with so-and-so building five, meeting with so-and-so building six, and you work on this building four. It just takes space like a, like a library <laughs> and it works out very well. So no one is assigned that dedicated space. What about industrial? I love industrial. Um, the workers though are producing a lot more than they were 47 years ago. Clearly Amazon has over 100,000 robots working in fulfillment centers. I have the opportunity, is anyone here work for Amazon? Good, then I can tell you how horrible it is now. Um, I toured one of the Amazon new facilities. It's the most inhumane place I've ever been in my entire life. It is built for robots who have no emotion, you know, and, and you know, not on drugs, whatever. But, you know, you get, I mean, it just is a, it's a place you don't want to be. So this robotic way is moving. But there's going to, about, going to be about 3 million robots worldwide going forward here. There's going to be 128,000 cobots in the US. That's workers and robots working together. This is not, you, many of you have Alexa at home, right? Or something, you know, those are just like little robots. They can do certain things or talk to you and maybe talk more than you want them to do, but they're there. Um, so this technology begins to change. And so the cost savings through this advanced technology is really reducing things that begin to happen here, reducing those costs and reducing that. And wages are low though, and automation is coming into that space here. That's why the new stacking systems and the higher ceiling heights and the way in which we compress people together, robots can do that far better. No breaks, no benefits, no healthcare, no complaints. You just plug them in and check them on the road, right? So that's what's happening in that space right there. So look at the transactional volume, off the charts, off the charts from that. Cap rates have gone way down. New construction has gone way up. Things are happening at an accelerated pace, absolutely accelerated pace. And look at the amount of deliveries. Remember you just saw office a minute ago and was way below that line, the average line there. Take a look at the industrial and where it is from that particular perspective here. It's above average, it's above where it's moving right there. Take a look at the transactional trends. Those are again, all the transactional trends. What did, when did it peak? Last year, $166 billion of transactions, almost double what it was back in 15 versus what office was. Huge amount of transactional volume. In industrial here, Richmond, you can just see here, as compared to office, rents are growing, accelerating in 22, 23, 24, going out, a positive trend going forward. So I like that space a great deal. Your vacancies are down low. You're a lot of millions, seven and a half million of, of square feet of, of industrial field and construction. Um, all this, you had 9.6 million square feet were leased in 2021. Rental rates are up. All these are positives, positives in this space. So what do I expect? 
I expect from industrial here, I expect a, a real increase by local, state, regional, all kinds of folks. We were not prepared for COVID. We're gonna see a lot more industrial space building. We'll have water, masks, we'll have medical facilities, we'll have cots, we'll have all kinds of stuff. Be prepared for the next pandemic. We're gonna see manufacturing change. We're gonna see that whole demand for that last mile distribution here. It's a billion square feet that we need for last mile distribution by 2025. Very, very positive in this particular space here. So, but they're gonna use robots and cobots. They're gonna use new technology, new stacking systems. I think we're gonna see a national logistics. We're seeing it now. We have a supply chain collapse in this country this year. Supply chain collapse. We're gonna see far better logistics policies, hopefully coming forward in the future, which allow us to be more dynamic in how we approach this year. And I think all landlords are expected to have everything that deals with ventilation and all those things that have COVID. So here's retail. Good luck for you. This is when you start digging something six feet down. Um, as you look at here, you can see that 10 years of e-commerce happened in three months in terms of just the e-commerce penetration that happened because of COVID. We're all buying stuff through Amazon or, or elsewhere, having our food delivered, everything else was going on from there. And so what accelerated this online moment, back in 2000, the online, so the, the, uh, the online commerce, there was, you know, point 8% of the total transaction volume. By 2020, it was up to 16% and climbing every year since then. Right now in 2021, there was almost seven, uh, 800, I'm sorry, $871 billion of e-commerce sales in this country. Huge acceleration, you can't avoid it. That's why I love industrial. Amazon is gonna probably control 50% of the US market. 50% of e-commerce goes through Amazon. It's incredible. So buy the stock, no. Um, but what happened here is that you take a look here where the consumer has taken a hold of the retail before I had to go to the retailer and tell me what to do, how to do it, what, what was the best thing. Now I can go online and see everything I want, see all the ratings, see all the product specifications. I don't need a store. And that allows me to do e-commerce. 81% of consumers go online before they go out and make your shop. You've all done that. You look at the ratings and kind of things. But Amazon can control 50% of this, of this commerce, and people do a significant portion, 66% do this research at home. It just means that we're going to see this acceleration occurring at a rapid pace. And only 41% of millennials shop at a traditional grocery store. I mean, it's, our, it's like our daughter. If I call my daughter right now and say, what are you having for dinner? And she'd go, oh, dinner, God, I don't know, because I go to Whole Foods. You know? I mean, it, it, it's not the same. And other generations would fill up their whole refrigerator, fill up their, you know, their pantry, fill up with food. It doesn't happen today. Everything is much more on demand, much more there. And global online sales are gonna reach about $17.5 trillion by 2030. And MCOM, which is mobile from your phone, is gonna be about $728 billion by 2025. These are significant. You look at the numbers, those dollars are not occurring at a store. That is the significant part of that. So what's happened in retail, other than a few portfolio, bureau portfolio sales here, for the most part, and these numbers, these, these charts are not the same in terms of the dollars on the left-hand side, so it's much smaller volume. But there's the number of square foot, square feet coming online, much more below average. We don't, don't have as much any, anymore. Again, we peaked in, in 2015 based on the data that's right there. So just you know, $90 billion of trade this year. The last year was about 76, $77 billion of trade. So all of that, just means for a much more dynamic place. In terms of here, you know, you've got a pretty good run right now. You're not as like the rest of the country. So I like that space a little bit here, but I want you to be very careful that this e-commerce impact and the omni-channel is something that affects retail in a dramatic way. So you're gonna grow and, and you do, do, do okay coming forward. Your vacancy rates are low right now. You got some absorption. So you got, you got stuff that's going on here, which is good. Cap rates are still a little high. But in general, you're at that precipice. So I would look upon retail much more here as on redevelopment opportunities where I can put an apartment and put some retail on below, then I would try just to refresh that retail. So what I'm gonna see here, we're gonna see, and you're gonna impact part of this, we're gonna see a 20 to 25% reduction in per capita of, of retail space, you know, square footage per capita in the US. Right now, we're at 23.5, one of the highest in the world amount of square footage we have for retail. So we're going to see a lot of bankruptcies, out of business signs, consolidation, mergers, things that happen there. We have fewer retailers and e-commerce will take a big part of that space. 
I think we're going to see 50% of retail space today repurposed into mixed use projects or other kind of activities that is not necessarily the same retail that they had there before. Um, so a lot of that's going to happen. I think the malls are going to continue to struggle. You're seeing that now. Uh, you saw Westfield just e exited the entire Westfield, one of the biggest mall owners in the world, just exited the U.S. Exited. We're getting out of, of the U.S., going back to Australia. So that, if they're telling you that after they just spent over almost a billion and a half dollars in Los Angeles and their mall there, they're just, we're out. We can't sustain it. Not sustainable. So when you get to that touchless consumerism and all those things happen in space becomes a little bit more challenging. Multifamily, probably the, one of the best places to be as well. Um, we got a bunch of folks that are getting old. All those people raise their hand, all those boomers there, they're getting old, you know, and so they're gonna move into the homes, you know, and, and they'll be force fed and whatever. It's be. But as it happens here, we have older people coming and getting older, which means the type of housing they need begins to change. And that's what they're poor there. The other problem we have is that developers have not built units for the work from home, the inability to buy a home activity. And if you take a look at those charts here, the single family develop, you know, are, are, the, are the green, multifamily apartments are the, are the blue. So you saw that a number of multifamily built what? One and two bedrooms. They didn't build very many three and four bedrooms, but the single family people built the three and four bedroom units where are the people that are working from home going to go? How can you have a husband and a wife and a kid and a dog and a parrot and a fish, or whatever, working in a one or two bedroom? Someone's going to get killed, okay? It's just not going to happen, which is what, oh, when rent single family homes. The single family rental home market is growing dramatically because of this. Multifamily has an opportunity to build more three bedrooms and lock offs and other kind of space that they could do. So we've seen that. The, the vacancy rates change. People don't want to be one town. They want to be in the Richmonds of the world. They want to be in other locations of which they don't have the urban crises, the urban challenges, whether it's crime or whatever it might be. They just, they don't want to be there. No, it's not, it's a fact. But here's what I said earlier at the beginning. I said the millennials are beginning to give up on home ownership. Look at the percentage in 18, 19, and 20. It changes and right off the bat. So when you begin to see people that already are saying, I'm going to rent for life, I'm not going to own a home, that's what's happening. And the price of homes in most metropolitan areas, whether it's here or elsewhere, whether it's 400, 500,000 or above, who can afford that as a starting out young employee or young couple? Very, very difficult, challenging. And today, oh, by the way, 8.5% inflation, oh, by the way, okay, how does this work? This is why rentals, remember? Food, shelter, wellness, all happening. And so construction has moved up. Cap rates have moved way down. A lot of it is being built here today. Look at the transactional volume just off the chart. And you'll see that in just a second. Off the chart, $335 billion traded last year in multifamily. The largest single asset class in the entire country. And it traded dramatically. They're almost 2x of the other. But the others was one half of what they did before. You know, it's like a, like a flip-flop between office and, and that. So that is why it's, it's such a dynamic place to be. In Richmond, you can see there, growing, you know, moving forward here. Um, and so all that is a positive thing. Now, you, you have a threat of overbuilding? Sure, like every market has a threat of overbuilding. But there's a lot of old buildings that are need to be replaced. So at the expense of some of the older properties, newer properties come in. But the number one challenge we have in our country is affordability in, in real estate. When the affordability of people that can afford to buy or even afford to rent there. The biggest risk to multifamily today is the nationalization of apartments. And they will, if the government determines that, uh, that you have a right, they call uh, um, a rent for, you know, a household for life or shelter for life, like healthcare is a right, shelter is a right. And so if they make shelter a right, they will do what they did in COVID. You can't evict, you can't have rent increase above this, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. That would happen unless real estate takes hold and begins to be able to do things, but requires the cities to be more compatible. There's more than enough money to build affordable homes. We don't have communities. They put so much licensing, so many fees, so much entitlement bureaucracy, so much stuff is happening, it doesn't make it work. But we have an opportunity, we also have some risk. So why do I like Virginia? I love Virginia, I love Virginia. Um, 
one of the best overall business climates in the country. You know, number one in cybersecurity, obviously, one of the greatest educated states, which means you have great colleges, great universities, a great workforce that's here, a right to work state. You just look down that list, every one of those, number one state across 85 different metros, according to CNBC, all of those, the best state for startups, you know, is just got a tremendous amount of intrinsic value. And the value of that is something that I think we just don't want to lose. So as you begin to look at that, you know, liking Virginia is a place that obviously we should all do. And clearly, you've got a lot of Appalachian trails for those who like the outdoors. So what are some predictions? I'm going to kind of go through a few predictions here, and then we'll leave some time for, for questions that come up here. So here's a couple of predictions for you. If I haven't got your mind spinning today, I hope that this will get your mind truly to start drinking heavily this afternoon. Um, don't be surprised to see warehouses in the sky. Drones will be delivering packages from satellites, warehouses, okay? And the average citizen in the US by 2030 will get four to five deliveries via drone each particular week. You say, Chris, this is insane. No, Amazon has a patent with the US government for exactly doing this. And they did that several years ago. And they're already on the way to having warehouses in the sky. Already down that path. So what does that mean then for delivery? What does that mean? How, how, how does it work? What does it mean for apartments? How do I? How does the drone come down? Where does it work for houses? You can see this tumultuous thing happening here, but Amazon is going to begin to deliver projects from drones, particularly for those outlying areas, you know, like Busted Creek, Mississippi, and Twisted Falls, Colorado, or someplace like that. They are normally trucks, not like Atlanta or, or you know, other places that are bigger cities. I told you, I think Google is going to acquire somebody. They're going to go acquire someone, whether that's JLL, or I know there's someone here from CoStar, so good luck. You know, short, the bar, short, the, short the stock today and you'll be fine. Um, <laughs> but as you begin to look at that, it is a quest for data, a quest for data. And that is something that will happen here. So I think that could happen uh, by the end of the you know, next 10 years. Vertical farms, they already exist. Vertical farming already exists. You're going to see more people bringing the the uh, uh, farm to you know farm to home, whatever it's called. You're bringing uh, the uh, ability to do that much closer to the cities, just like you saw in Disney World. If you went down there and you have you know, those big old tomatoes and those melons, they're all growing hydroponics and all that kind of stuff growing in those in that tour. Same way. Another example of this is so clear, so clear. Is it all the way across the country in those states where what? Marijuana is legal is now being grown in warehouses. Not just in some hippie joint out there in the middle of a forest in Chico, you know, but this is what, what they're growing in in these organized farms with hydroponics. Hydroponics means what? No insecticides, no need for fertilizers, water doesn't get evaporated. I can grow 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I can use solar power. I can regenerate and recycle water. I can do all those things in a building closer to the community. So watch for this. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet about this and you'll see it. Buildings are already done, designed, things are there. I think the 35% of real estate firms in existence today will be gone, will be gone. Primarily because of the legacy exits. If they haven't put a program in place to transfer to the next generation leaders or the next generation owners, then they will probably go. As they disappear, it's a great opportunity to capture talent, to capture market share, to capture that. For those who really understand succession, for those who understand transition, those who want to be in business 10 years from now, they can position yourself to do that. But there'll be about, again, 35% of today's firms will be gone. I think that housing I talked about is, will probably be declared a right um, along with healthcare. I think that's very much going down the path that we're here right now. Um, and so I think that that how we do that and how it's being done is going to be accommodated, but we do not have enough. We have a horrible homeless problem in this country. Um, we have a, a, a just incredible lack of affordability problem. And with the economy not moving at all, incredible rising debt, inflation at eight and a half percent right now, it is no reason we can't begin to think about how we can help generate people and get them back to work. We've got to do that. We can't just keep writing checks and, and, and borrowing money. Uh, the U.S. I think is going to eliminate cash by the end of the decade for sure. We're not going to have money in our pocket anymore. 
You can already do that by your credit card, your your iPhone, your i your iWatch, your 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 iPhone, whatever you want to do. You can pay digitally, you know, from doing that. That's all going to happen. But why would they want to do that? Why would why would you eliminate cash? Because in the U.S. today, we have a one point one trillion dollar underground economy. People that are not reporting their you pay, a, you give a person a tip, you give this, you give that guy five bucks, 10 bucks for this, you do that. You buy a sandwich from someone, they don't report it, not being reported. If money is eliminated, it allows the government to do what? To tax, and that's what they're gonna do. Do not be surprised as part of this to see a national sales tax come in. As our debt becomes so high that they'll do one of these, well, it's only gonna be 1%, and, you know, and then a year later, well, it's one and a half, well, it's two and a half, well, it's eight and a half, you know? I mean, it never goes down, it only goes up. And so if that happens, do not be surprised to see the elimination of money. I think we'll see that 50% of workers are gonna be freelancers. So get used to that. How does your company gonna respond? How are you gonna be organized for that? How do you make that happen? How is that going to happen? I think that clearly 80% of the doctor visits, 80% of doctor visits are gonna be automated examinations and digitized health platform, healthcare platforms. You'll see that. The, the increasing rise of the, of the uh, physician assistant are gonna be doing a lot more things that doctors do. You'll be able to play and plug, in essence, your healthcare for many other things. Um, that'll be part of it. But there are apartment people we work with now, uh, actually north of here, um, that are moving in that direction where every apartment complex is gonna have a healthcare where you, you can come in, you can get you know, uh, optically, what we call it, a digitized way in which you can get diagnosed with your physician. So work on that technology now, try to make that happen. I think that 15 to 20% of all new construction will be printed buildings, printed. You can see examples of that on the internet today where they can build apartment units and build things automated, printing them, just print them out right off the bat. And modular construction, when you use modular construction, you can reduce the, the waste by over 30% of waste. Remember, they, they, they cut a piece of wood, they have a bent nail, they have all this stuff. Modularization disappears all of that. And it's like working with, with Legos on steroids, okay? It's the way in which things can be built. But when you eliminate that, the only thing that stops this, the only thing that stops this, is that every single doggone city has its own zoning rules and its own ways of, well, this is why your electricity has to go here and the plumbing has to go there, you have to go to this, you have to get a permit there. We don't have any standardization in the country, therefore modularization will not occur in the manner in which it could until we get some more standardization of how that happens. But they will gonna see a lot more construction in that way. I think we'll see the rise of crypto technology and Bitcoins to do real estate transactions. Um, I just think that's, you know, again, people move to that, that platform. I think that's gonna be going forward here. I think that 20 to 30% of food that's sold in grocery stores and restaurants will be manufactured using 3D. They can manufacture 3D food today manufacturing food and there's a huge movement to get rid of cattle in this country get rid of beef entirely because that is about 60 or 70 percent of the methane gases that go up come from ag so they want to eliminate the, the the eliminate beef but they can make beef they can make all those things using you know different technologies it exists today it exists today driverless cars are going to be probably 20 to 30 percent of the vehicular traffic Driverless cars, driverless trucks. That'll be interesting to see how that happens in New York when no one obeys any rules. But it was, you know, how this works, we'll find out. But again, the point is in particular areas like this, you'll see that very happening. I think we'll see a huge move to put a lot of government services will all go virtual. You're not gonna really interact with the government much at all, except online, you know, a way in which you connect. And so when you have that, it means what less space, we can move government away from you know, centralized government to more decentralized, you know, what would happen if the Department of Interior moved to Colorado or what would happen if HUD moved to Chicago or whatever, you know, you can think about the endless things if we don't need location necessarily to be there. I think the office space, this whole open office and that begins to change because I think you're gonna see that much more of a reservation system, a reservation system based on priorities and needs and everyone will be able to do that and it'll be much more digitized, you can see it and just book your space, much like I describe what our daughter does. But that'll happen as well. I think we're gonna see remote learning. Colleges are gonna change. Many of these small liberal art colleges are gonna go disappear, gonna disappear. 
because part of that is that when you see it, you can get certifications and specializations, and that could be 40 to 50% of the current campus activity based on that. We just need more people that know how to service things and do things, you know, computer technology, you know, and programmers or people that can solve those kind of, you know, computer issues, or we need nurse assistants and physicians assistants. It doesn't require a four-year degree in doing that. You know, we don't need four-year degrees in, you know, Greek history and, I don't know, some old goofy subjects. Um, you you kind of need them to say, we got to make society work. And so we're going to see that as going to change the nature, which I think brings education much more closer to you. I think we're going to see every apartment, or at least I hope every apartment right now, I think about 35% of them are going to adopt local charities. When you go rent an apartment in the future, they will offer charities you can donate to as a part of your rent. In some cases, they may be matching money. You put a dollar in, we'll put in 10, you know, 50 cents in or 10 cents in or wherever it might be. But the point is we're going to see more community interaction and apartment life. I think we're going to see right now 30 to 35% of people buying single family homes will be investors. You know what it is today? 25% of single family homes being sold today are sold to investors. We're going to move to 30 to 35%, which means that single family for rent is going to be continue to be a growing space and a growing sector in everything that happens here. I think online retail sales is going to cause 25 to 35% of small mid-side retailers to go out of business. You just is I can get a quicker, faster, better. I don't have to go down. Parking's an issue. Da, da, da. You go down the list of things. They don't have what I want. I, you know, whatever it is. I can get everything I need online. I can get everything I need from Amazon. Office, industrial, I'm sorry, office retail, multifamily assets are going to shift to much more of that omni-channel experience I talked to you about. Omni-channel means I have an e-commerce, I have a direct connection, I have multi-ways in which I interact and connect with you. They will have a wellness folks I talked about. Every place you live is going to have wellness. Where you work will have wellness. Everything will be about wellness and taking care of people and that personalization, allowing you to do whatever you want to do. I think that you'll see in office buildings and, and uh, multi-family communities and that stuff, we will, we will all be wearing chips. We're going to be wearing chips. The chips will allow you, the digitization will allow you to get into the elevator, allow you to get into your office building. We'll turn on lights. We'll give you every information you have on these digital chips. And if I don't want to really scare you, maybe in 10 or 15 years, you're going to have that chip in your shoulder. That will come with you wherever you are. And it'll have your whole medical history will be right there on your shoulder. And that can be instantly accessed by any doctor, any place, any time to give you that instant access. I think we're going to see leasing a virtual office space. You know, um, and I think that's going to be well, what, 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 where do I meet if we're going to do it? That's where Zoom and Teams and others have sort of created that artificial space, but it's only about where people are located rather than bringing people together in a particular location. So watch for that to begin to happen over the next decade. Also, you're going to see the commercial and apartment leases are going to be shorter. We have much multiple sort of renewal options, you know, according to that. And if you're a larger space user, you will rent space based on units of consumption. Big tenants will take, I'm gonna buy a million units for two bucks a foot. And I can use those in Chicago, Denver, Richmond, you know, Atlanta, Miami, where am I? I can use it anywhere. It's gonna be like a digital chip. I mean, a digital currency that they can use. So they're gonna buy by units, not always by square feet. So you can see there's a lot of changes, a lot of things happening. But we are on the precipice of some of the most exciting times in our industry where each one of you, each one of you have an opportunity to make a difference. Our industry is the unfinished business of society. We are the industry that shaped all of our communities. We shape the fabric of our communities. We shape the lifestyle of our communities. We are the, the heart and soul of our country. And so we have an opportunity to reclaim that mantle, an opportunity to make this a better place. And in times like this, when you have this amount of disruption and turmoil and transition and transformation, now is the time to seize that mantle of opportunity. I think all of you can. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. There you go. Thank you. 
Uh, let's start by uh, thanking Chris. That was a lot of good information. Uh, you do have me worried a little bit about the accounting industry based on your uh, automation slide. We'll adjust. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Vince Nader. I'm tax practice leader at Kiter. Um, thanks to Commonwealth Commercial for sponsoring. Uh, it's great to be back at this event. Um, we're going to jump into a Q&A uh, panel in just a minute. Um, for folks that aren't familiar with Kiter, uh, founded in 1978, uh, one of the largest independent certified public food, shelter, and welfare firms headquartered in Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> uh, all decisions at Kiter start with our core values. Uh, they include innovation, collaboration, relationships, and accountability, most of which are on display today at this event. Uh, real estate and construction is one of Kiter's largest uh, industry focus groups. We have 20 industry specialists that help our clients in a variety of ways. Transaction consulting, qualified opportunity zones, traditional audit and tax services, many other ways. That's enough about Kiter. Uh, now we'll enter into the uh, question and answer portion of the program. Uh, we have a great panel of industry experts. Uh, if they want to make their way up to the stage as I uh, provide a little bit of color. Ashley and Drew. Uh, we have today Drew Instis, Director of Business Development, Arco Design Build Industrial. Drew has over 15 years of experience in the construction industry. I'm going to go. Okay. With expertise in strategic and operational marketing and client relationships. Drew joined Arco in 2018 after a few long term stints, including five years as project manager for Whiting Turner and five years as sales manager for Trimble. Drew plays an integral role in driving new business opportunities for Arco, as well as finding solutions to the needs of Arco's future clients. Drew is an SIOR associate member and a member of NAIOP DC, Maryland and NAIOP Baltimore. Welcome, Drew. We also have Ashley Peace, president of Sour Properties. Ashley has extensive real estate knowledge, including commercial real estate, land use planning and valuation. She previously worked as director of real estate and construction for Lidl US and as director of real estate development for HH Hunt Corporation. Ashley's responsible for strategic leadership and operations at Sour Properties. Recent projects include the development of the 330,000 square foot Sour Center on West Broad Street in Richmond, Virginia. It's a really nice property. She's active in Graker, Richmond Crew, and is a member of VCU's Real Estate Circle of Excellence. And we also have Jane Dufresne, Richmond Division Senior Vice President, Highwoods Properties. Jane has over 27 years of real estate experience, the majority of which have been with Highwoods after joining the company in 1995. Jane is responsible for all aspects of the division, including marketing and leasing, wholly owned and third party property management, and new development opportunities. Jane is past president of Richmond Crew and Graker, currently serves as the president of the Innsbruck Owners Association Board, and is also a member of VCU's Real Estate Circle of Excellence. We have uh, a couple of folks in the audience with microphones, so if you have a question for the panel, please raise your hand and they'll, they'll come out to you. I'm gonna turn it over to the panel now. Thanks, guys. Oh, you want, <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say, yeah, please, as our, our guests are uh, developing their questions, I, I might ask uh, our distinguished panel to comment on one or two really salient points that you heard today and uh, how that might relate to your market here in Richmond. Thank you. Jane, I'm, you I'm in the hot seat. I, I've done office all my life, so <laughs> um, I guess I should transform my buildings into um, either vertical marijuana plants, <laughs> uh, farms, or maybe self-storage. Um, I think um, in seeing those slides, and I did get to see them, I did, did get to preview them, they come across as a little shocking, and perhaps they are the whole view of the country, um, Richmond being a tertiary market. I think we've been lucky not to have 
too many people entering the market and spec building, office building. So although our office stock is um, older, we are a little bit more resilient than other markets. And I'm also excited that we are somewhat in the Sun Belt, and that is the migratory pattern. So um, we actually saw more leasing last year than we did then in it rivaled 2019 and I would say our average lease term actually has gone up this quarter from 4.1 years uh, last year to an average lease term of 5.9 years so I do think there is a general feeling that office was dying two years ago um, I remember being on a virtual panel with Neil Amin and I thought oh god I'm so glad I'm not Neil with hospitality and today I kind of feel like I'm Neil <laughs> here, uh, defending office, but I think um, you said it best when people do need to get together. I think companies culture is eroding with all of us working remotely and there is a need for office space. I like in our situation to being in an aircraft carrier with a hole in the side of it and it is a slow leak. So we need to be smart about making our buildings commute worthy and making them well and uh, a place where people do want to come to. And I mean, maybe they don't come five days a week, but we are seeing a return to the office. And I think Richmond's a, a pretty safe bet um, considering interest rates are going up, the cost of construction is overwhelmingly high and trying to keep the office building stock as up to date and healthy as we can, um, I think will be uh, okay. But we also don't want to turn a blind eye to what is happening and the way that people work and the way they want their buildings to function for them. Um, so an owner needs to be eyes wide open and um, agile and being able to pivot and change the spaces that are within the building to give the people what they want, which is a healthy building, a place that they can get together and meet um, and be collaborative and, and full of community. So I do think we're shifting towards what we've done in Innsbruck, which is to create the urban mixed use overlay district and rezone a bunch of property to bring in multifamily. People need to live near their uh, office and they want to walk, they want walkability and they want nature. So we're in the suburbs, thank goodness, um, and always able to change. But I think Richmond's a great office market. We do have a 12% vacancy rate, which honestly, two years ago, I think people thought it would be 50. But, um, you know, it's, it's a split. I guess it's my time to leave. The slugfest for sure right now, but um, people are out there looking for office space. So I, I, I hear what you say, but I'm not, um, I'm not completely in your, in your camp. <laughs> it's, like the, it's like the McLaughlin hour. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, everything you just said, I agree with. I think part of the, the purpose of what you do when you, when you present information like this is if you don't present it in a way that challenges people to think. Yeah. And I think that's what I'm, my attempt is to challenge you to think. Um, for all the reasons you said, that's why I like Richmond and I like, you know, like Virginia. Um, but I want all of you to think, because if you just rely and think that what happened yesterday or a year ago or two years ago, three years ago, this conversation about wellness and you know, engagement and all that, those words didn't probably happen. Mm -hmm. And so that's the change that's occurring and that's why we're on the same page. We're after the same page. Right. Um, I, is this thing, this is working, right? Yeah. Sorry, I was, just wanted to make sure. Um, no, early on in your presentation, you said something about, you know, some things were changed or accelerated by COVID, and you said we're never going back, or we're not going back anytime soon, if I'm paraphrasing that right. And it kind of got me thinking, you know, at Arco, we build pretty much all warehouses. We're a warehouse design builder is what we specialize in. And I was just thinking, you know, an example would be like, my parents who are about 70 years old, they never bought anything online. And they could have bought stuff online, but they resisted it, resisted it, resisted it. They said, why well, don't need to buy things online? And then COVID happened and they started buying stuff online just out of convenience because stores were closed. And now that COVID's pretty much over, they haven't gone back, right? And I mean, my wife and I bought stuff online, but not, not convenience items. Like we wouldn't buy batteries online or diapers online. We'd be like, oh, let's just go to the store. And then we realized, you know, you need batteries and it might take you three days to get to the store to buy them or you can order them on Amazon and they you know throw them through your window 12 <laughs> hours later and so we haven't gone back on that either and 
I, that just kind of resonated with me because that's what we're seeing with building warehouses is like the demand continues to seem to not be met. I'm not saying it'll never get met, but like there, we're building more and more warehouses because I think people need more and more places to put stuff so that it's ready for e-commerce, last mile, what have you. Um, and we're seeing, you know, construction prices are reflecting that because so, for example, uh, steel pricing went way up during, you know, the last 18 or so months. It is plateaued, but it seems like it's not really going back. You know, a lot of our customers were saying, well, what if we just wait? You know, a year ago, they were saying, what if we just wait 10 months until this is over? Will it come back down again? And at the time we were saying, we don't know. But now it seems to be pretty clear that it's it's not really coming down. It just went up and it's staying up there. And it, that might change a year from now, who knows? But there's other, there's other price factors that are kind of doing the same thing. So that, that kind of hit home with me as far as we're not going back to where we were and we don't really know what tomorrow is, but it, it won't be, it won't be yesterday. I thought that was a good, good point. Yep. So I'm a little bit like Jane in the hot seat. So we are in retail and office. <laughs> Lucky us at Sour Properties. Um, but I would say that this presentation is extremely validating because we have already made the shift to diversify our portfolio. And the really great thing about COVID made us, uh, made our team kind of take a deep dive and really understanding our assets. And thankfully all of our properties are strategically located in great, um, you know, great submarkets throughout Richmond. And so we have an opportunity for redevelopment plays everywhere. Um, and so a huge project that we're working on right now is uh, we're very fortunate to have about 450 acres at the airport that we rezone to industrial. So we are going to be getting into the industrial space and self-developing industrial warehouse um, facilities. And then we have great properties um, that happen to be retail shopping centers. And we're looking at opportunities to reconfigure those into quasi mixed use with apartments. So we will be getting into multifamily. And then we have an amazing property right here um, uh, in uh, kind of the greater Scotts Edition area. We've got 36 contiguous acres at the Sauer Center. And we were really fortunate to be able to lease out 100% of our office space. During COVID, when we thought the whole world was shutting down and none of our tenants were gonna need office anymore, uh, but the office space that they are, um, that they all fit out are these great, amazing hubs for what I call the three C's for culture, collaboration, um, and communication. So they are, you know, I would say that we don't have a lot of people who are in and out of those office spaces every day because we relocated and so we're, we're on site and so we can see the traffic in the cars. Uh, but all of the employers have said, like, we still want to have this hub so that we can gather and we can build culture and we can build our teams and have people interface and have special events. And so I think that probably is gonna be the new wave of office. And that's what we're gonna think about when we're redeveloping future phases of the Sauer Center. Um, but it'll all be just a, a mix of uses moving forward. That, that's a perfect example of where COVID caused you to, to relook mm -hmm. at the assets, caused you to reposition the assets, caused you to do some of them, whether it's rezoning or changing that. And that is exactly what's happening everywhere. That's, that's great. That, that's, that sounds perfect. And I will say on the retail side, surprisingly, we are doing a shopping center redevelopment and never in my career after COVID would I thought that we would have prioritized that project. Um, but it will be grocery anchored and we're having, um, we, we've got national retailers who are coming into Richmond for the first time. So I think the retailers that made it through COVID are really, really well capitalized and they're looking for expansion opportunities. And you know, Shake Shack is a perfect example. They haven't been in the Richmond market. We're taking an old Applebee's, we demolished it. We're gonna be redeveloping that into a Shake Shack restaurant, but they are doing a drive-through. So they have completely recalibrated their real estate strategy to be, you know, to, to go just from a, a sit-in, dine-in restaurant to drive-throughs now. Uh, so I think the retailers have been um, just really innovative with how they're um, continuing you know, their operations and expansion. Just as an example of that, um, I'm on the board of one of the largest Hispanic grocers in the country, mm -hmm. and they're going to add 100 new centers you know, over the next several years, but they're all grocery anchored. And again, 
you know, just exactly what you just said, you know, as long as you have food, shelter, wellness, mm -hmm. but you get that grocery mm -hmm. and you make the, the central with more programmatic elements, that then allows people to view it as a destination, mm -hmm. not as just an experience, you know, a one-time event. So if you go from event to experience or event to a destination, then it's called that length of stay. And if we can keep them longer at those centers, mm -hmm. then you capture the wallet beyond the the grocery, right? You, you capture that wallet. It's like a casino. You once you get in, you can't get out. You know? The wallet that's not full of money. <laughs> no, as long as it's got, the, it's all digitized. And they do have boozy milkshakes, so that's right. <laughs> Drive through. Interesting. <laughs> Drive through. And even sea laws loosen, so it's going to be perfect. <laughs> Scott. If anybody else has any questions, just raise your hand, and either Michael or I will come find you. Would you hear me? All right. Uh, question. I think everybody here has kind of talked about the impact COVID has had on either their own um, shopping. Uh, I think the, the impact, everybody here on the panel has commented about the impact COVID has had on how they make buying decisions either in their household or professionally. Do you guys see online marketplaces um, being something that is adopted more moving forward. And when I say that, when you are looking to make acquisitions or, or dispositions, do you think people are more comfortable transacting online? Don't you guys respond first? I mean, I, we're a construction company, so we're, we're not, you know, we're not doing real estate transactions, but I, kind of to your point, I will say online stuff has, integrated our business a lot more over the last couple of years than you know probably 10 or so years before that so we're doing a lot more you know teams and zoom meetings we're doing a lot more of our of our payment um you know invoicing and, and capture of payment and stuff like that is done through different kinds of online software whereas before you were like printing out invoices and notarizing them and sending them to uh, um to um the clients and then they were mailing us paper checks and all that stuff was possible before COVID, but for whatever reason, COVID has kind of sped that whole process along. So you had online and digital stuff, yeah, but, but it's not really the exact answer to your question. Hey, Paul, so in the past, we would program cafes and buildings. Every couple of buildings or so, we would program a Take Five Cafe, and we're changing that program to accommodate the Grubhub and the Uber Eats drop-off. So instead of having it just sitting on the lobby table, you would have a refrigerated area with cubicles and and so trying to move towards the trend of of immediate food on demand um, and also the customer experience everyone is on his or her or their phones and so we want to be able to provide our customers with an experience and the building linked together so uh, there are many software platforms out there that offer that where you can customize your building you know, dial up what's the weather, what's happening in the building this week, um, put your work order in, and it's totally customized and, and, and a touch away. So yes, absolutely disrupting and moving the office space into the future. You know, one of the things I didn't talk about, but we're just doing a big survey, a lot of survey on what, what attracts talent to companies. And you look at other studies, what attracts talent to, to tenants, you know, and it is these things you talked about, it's, it's the experience and it's gonna be all the amenities and services that are around there. It's not just that space you, anymore. You know, talk about Marriott buying Avalon Bay. I mean, really, we need to become um, the hospitality industry's arm. We That's need correct. the hospitality industry to reprogram our you know, old tired office buildings into the future of work. That's correct. And as that's that added programmatic element that I think is, is so needed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great. I mean, I think that's the kind of stuff that will attract people. And, and what are most employers concerned about? How do I attract and retain young people? And if the buildings are tired and old, and there's not food facilities or amenities and other services, a gym and other things that might be accessible, why be here? You know? Right. And also ESG at the top you know, list. Now it used to be just lead. Now it's ESG. What are you doing as a company? Uh, within your company, and we want to align ourselves with a company that has social and governmental standards and environmentally right. and you, focused. And you may, you may find tenants 
who cannot leave space unless the billing has scored mm -hmm. a certain way, either on ESG mm -hmm. or health rating or whatever. You, I don't care what how great the space it. is. If you don't have that health rating, you're not. They're not. Right. They're not going to do it. Oh, Meryl. <laughs> Y'all kind of started going down the road that I was going to ask about, but this is mainly for Ashley and um, Jane. What are you doing? Um, what are you doing? Um, what are you doing to uh, attract and retain tenants? At, and I mean, wh why? Why do you think you you were able to uh, attract 100% during COVID? And what do you think specifically you need to do to keep people? So I think it comes down to real estate fundamentals, right? It's location. And so on the retail side, it's really been an extraordinary phenomenon. We had an aging portfolio of retail assets and um, probably slightly below market rents. And we went through COVID. We lost a lot of tenants. We had a lot of vacancies, several bankruptcies, uh, Steinmark being an example in two of our centers. Well, the best thing happened. Uh, we had a national retailer come in who um, we're actually bringing two new retail concepts to our shopping center in Shore Pump. Excellent location, not a lot of opportunity to backfill a box in that submarket. So now they're paying us much higher rent and going to be a stable, you know, retailer and stabilize like the whole rest of that center. Uh, I wouldn't say that that is um, a case study for everyone. <laughs> But it just speaks to if you've got great real estate they're not making more land so there's something that you can do with it that's going to be you know strong and you just have to think what does the community need and um you know i think the same goes for sour center awesome location in an emerging area we're right across the fan we're on broad street it's you know a, all really interesting um beautiful historic warehouses that we've adaptively reused um, and constructed into class a office and so it's a neat place and it's by Whole Foods. It doesn't get any better than that. And we have excessive parking, which we'll discuss that when you come back in a few years, <laughs> what to do with the excessive parking. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, who wouldn't want to live there, right? And I think we're, we're definitely going to be looking at multifamily and mixed use and some other things on site because, um, you know, it's a great spot. I think mixed use is the answer mm -hmm. to the problem. You can't have a shopping center over here and your house over here, your office building over there. I mean, it's just, it's not the future. The future is being together and, and mixing up the uses so that people can walk to where they would want to shop and live and play and giving people access to nature um, and health and wellness. That's really our focus is, is the fit well buildings versus the lead. It's all about health and wellness for the employee. That's exactly right. Okay, we're done. I think we're standing in the way of cocktails. Well, I, okay. think the, I think the uh, last <laughs> question is how soon can we uh, get to the cocktail? So I'm going to close things out here and just take a moment and thank Chris Lee again for coming. Um, we have a we uh, have a small gift of our uh, appreciation from all of the sponsors. <laughs> Obviously, I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, again for your participation. My name is Paul Denton. I am a recovering Commonwealth Commercial Partners employee. I'm really excited to be back here today with everybody. Um, thanks again to all of the sponsors. Um, I'm with 10X. We are the world's largest online marketplace, which is why I asked that question. I'm really excited to hear some of the really interesting predictions that came out of the uh, talk today. Um, was really refreshing to hear from our panelists. I keep up with a lot of you guys online, see the awesome things that you're doing to make Innsbruck more of a, of a community, seeing all the awesome things Sour is doing. I think you're exactly right. Location is, is all, all what it comes down to. And then obviously industrial is just really hot now. So excited to see what you all do. Thanks for coming. Drinks are outside. Let's network and uh, shake some hands and meet face to face instead of virtual. Thank you, everybody.